How do we as a society co-evolve with our technologies? Well, both of them are intricately linked. Ever when we climbed down the trees and went into the caves and distinguished ourselves from the rest of the animals, we have been using tools, especially to distinguish ourselves and do that. We need also these tools to build ourselves, the shelters, the caves to protect ourselves from the animals and, and shape our environment. We became a species that shaped its own environment thanks to our tools. Back in the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, this Iron Age, we used extensions of ourselves, tools as extensions of ourselves, technologies, and we created artificial claws and teeth with stones, with bronze and with iron that helped us to shape our environment around ourselves. Thanks, and we were able to do that thanks to these extensions of, of our physical bodies. So. If you look back at, at those days, we, we judge the advancement of human development or progress by their tools. And, and that is also quite intuitive because from the session where we talked about what technology is, you know that technology is basically a reflection of the knowledge, what we understand about the world, and we embed that into a physical structure. So. The technology of the times reflects our understanding about the universe around us. And we would also not only do that by judging more primitive species, also we probably would do the same thing if we would judge a more advanced species. For example, imagine an extraterrestrial species would come to visit us here on planet Earth. How would we know if they are more or less advanced than us? Well. What we do is we look for evidence of alien technology, because if they have some technology that kind of like we don't understand, maybe they could beam something or rob something and go through space and time and like whoop, do something with like a sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. So we would say like, whoa, that's magic. Well, they are like, we don't know how to do this space time warp thing that they are doing. So they must be more advanced than us. They understand more advanced aspects of the universe around us, and they embedded that in a physical structure, thanks to their technology. So, you know, technology is, is not toys for the boys, or let's say it's not only toys for the boys, and boys really uh, sometimes get really crazy, but technology is actually a reflection of, of human progression, of human development, and especially of societal development. Uh, and that's uh, how we use it. And so in our framework of innovation theory, if we go for the long ways that did not start with the Industrial Revolution, right? Usually you'd say, well, these long ways that no, they started ever, as I said, ever since we became humans and created civilizations. And, you know, over the history, we all got a lost here a little bit in the Middle Ages. These were long, dark ages where we got a little lost because we spread out in different tribes of us innovated at different speeds. So historians argue about that. And I'm not going to get into this discussion here of, of trying to classify that. And then when NASA and globalization brought us together, ship traffic connecting the old and the new world, and then colonization also some dark ages. But we, we then came together more again as a global species, these different tribes that have been have been lost for, for some centuries. And so that made it easy for historians, again, to find some dates where we say like, okay, we started to harness water and then it spread, it diffused uh, quite rapidly, inevitably inequality is created uh, throughout the world. And then steam power, electric power, motor power, and now in the information age, data. And as far as I can see, now we're going into the knowledge age. So, so this theory has been theorized by economists for quite some time. The, the first economist was a Russian economist, Kontrativ or Kontrativ. The pronunciation depends on where, where you're from and how you want to say his name. And he realized that there are some long waves in human evolution. And these contrative waves are periods of waves that range between 40 to 60 years. And the cycle consists of alternating intervals between high growth and relatively slow growth. So society kind of like takes a breath. It is quickly developing and then slowly developing, quickly and slowly, which is 
very similar to how technology does in disruptive innovation and continuous innovations. So this is also reflected in a kind of like rhythm and how society evolves. Uh, the economist that, who then really conceptualized it, and we will talk a lot about him today is Josef Schumpeter. And Schumpeter then kind of like made a theory out of it. So he had the Industrial Revolution, the age of steam and the age of electricity. And together, based on what Kontrativ empirically detected, he really wrote it up and, and made a theory and explained how this works in a capitalistic system, actually, in a market economy. And this then was continued by other scholars, more modern scholars, Freeman and Paris, who added other Contrative long waves to it. The automobile, the information and telecommunication revolution. And now, as I said, only history can judge. And for me, it might be dubious and probably a little bit more than dubious speculation, but we're probably now going, and they call it this, they give them numbers, first contrative, second. And so according to, if I count that, that would be the sixth contrative that we're in. But as I said, it did not start with industrial revolution. It actually started long before. So if you count the different waves, what are the number of the waves? That really depends. That's in the eye of the, of the beholder. Now, let's look at that. So what the Wikipedia article here tells us is these are waves of length from 40 to 60 years. Is Now, is that true? Are these waves and do they really go up and down like this, and how can we imagine that? All right, let's look at what Schumpeter called the contours of economic evolution. That's actually a name of one of his chapters. So what is, what is the shape of these waves? So let's look at that with some empirical evidence. We could, for example, here map the US energy consumption. And we can see here, yes, during the combustion revolution, whoa, did we start to consume a lot of energy, and then it wiggled around here, then we take off again. So you can see it doesn't line up perfectly with the energy consumption, but yes, we can see some kind of, of waveforms. On average, our energy consumption has grown at about 3% per year. Now we can you look at gross domestic product, economic activity, and we can see here some waves too. So actually, yes, it does map up since the 1700s. We have here a wave going here, little wiggle here, wiggle here, then the 2008 financial crisis, and we go up again. Our economic activity has grown at about 1.5% per year. So uh, these are average growth rates. It's These are exponentials. And as I said in a previous lecture, you can always represent an exponential progression as a doubling rate that makes more intuitively sense. So a growth rate of 3% doubles about every 23, every 25 years, let's say, and a growth rate of 1.5% doubles every, like every 50 years. So energy consumption has doubled every 25 years, and our economic activity has doubled every 50 years. It's like one generation and it doubled. And But this is not a straight line of exponential progress. We actually have these waves, these contours of economic evolution. And that's what we are interested in. Now, sorry that I have to correct the Wikipedia article a little bit, because if I look at what happens here, if that's how we classify it, we can see that these waves always have become shorter. And if you go back to the previous slides where I showed you that the Stone Age lasted for about 2 million years and the Bronze Age for 2,000 years, then yes, the Water Age only lasting for about 70 and the Steam Age lasting for dominating the economy for about 50 years. And now about, we are like down 30 years. It became shorter from the bird's eye view. Now, is it perfect? It's probably, probably not. And you can see here, like, does it really become, oh, it's, it's not deterministic. Social science is, you know, it's a living organism. It's, it's not a mathematically extremely well defined process, but we can see in general, these periods of innovation have become shorter. And the reason for that, you know, from our discussion of technological progress has to do with that. This is an exponential process. So we grow exponentially. Therefore, things become faster and faster, as my grandma used to say. So now the structure of this goes very similar of how we have uh, how technological progress works. Now, the main characteristics are very similar to the main characteristics of technological change. First, we have, in general, an exponential progress. We have an exponential curve averaging 
over the wiggles, but if we zoom in, there are some wiggles every once in a while. So there are different waves. It happens in jumps, what biologists call punctuated equilibriums, what engineers call a disruptive innovation. And we have that as well in social evolution. So these are the different paradigms. We call them social, economical, political paradigms, so for lack of a better word. And additionally, what becomes very clear in social evolution, it also happens in, it also applies to biological and to technological evolution, but it becomes more clear in social evolution because it's a little slower, is that this process is accumulative. So when we first started to optimize material with the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, the Iron Age, we still do this. We still have mining and agriculture, and it still creates value to process raw materials. And this also continued to evolve. For example, imagine about plastic. Maybe we don't innovate a lot right now in stone and in bronze and in iron, but in advanced plastics or nanomaterials. So this is still continuing. Now, is it the driving force of current social evolution? No, others have to come to grow faster. Same as with optimizing energy. We are still innovating and optimizing energy and we're making energy more efficient and we're making it um, less harmful for the environment with alternative energy sources. Uh, and that still creates a lot of value. So all of that continues to create value for us. Now, what came on top additionally here is the process of optimizing information. Do that in two ways. We optimize data and communication processes and now knowledge processes, which we then also use to make energy production more efficient and uh, the, the transformation of matter, of material more efficient. So it's an accumulative process. So long story short, we now this, this picture you've seen throughout the course already several times, but now we're really breaking it down and developing it. It's a process that's accumulative, happens in these jumps, in these disruptions, in these technological revolutions, and is exponential. So now if we're bringing it all together and we have used this slide throughout uh, this, this specialization, throughout this lecture series already. And now let's break it down. Today, we're gonna look much more deeper into where that comes from. So we said we have different periods of humans evolution. We can also have really long waves. This would be first, we started to dominate matter. Then we started to dominate energy we call them industrial revolutions. And now we start to dominate information. We call it the digital revolutions and they have subwaves. Now, all of them are accumulative. We still transform matter and energy, even now in the digital age, and that still creates value for us. We also still innovate in this. So these waves don't disappear. Now, they still happen with revolutions. So it's still, it's revolutionary. These what we call jumps or Biologists, punctual equilibriums, disruptive innovations, engineer call them disruptive innovations. Let's just call them technological revolutions, which lead to paradigm shifts. So it's revolutionary, this process. It's, it's a very brutal process, same as revolutions, uh, very brutal. And, and we will talk more about revolutions. You know, revolutions are a brutal process. Things get, people get, people die in revolutions and things get destroyed in revolutions and new things emerge in revolution. So while we usually hail technological revolutions, we also have to be really look at it and, and see how much destruction it does. And we'll talk a lot about this today. The process of creative destruction that is in this revolutionary paradigm shifts. And now if you take a bird's eye view and just have one line, it, it progresses exponential, which makes it fast and makes it go faster and faster. Now, this is the perspective from the perspective of innovation theory. And usually, so economists came up first with that. That doesn't mean that economists own that story. This is the story of humankind. Uh, you can classify that also in many different ways. Political scientists could classify it. Or, for example, like that depends on what you define as progress. I could now draw a different line here. It's just a different performance indicator. And what this green line here presents is not economic evolution. What that would be would be health evolution. Here I mapped out the life expectancy at birth. 
And you know, it's very difficult to argue also for economists, what could be more important than, you know, life expectancy. Maybe that is the fundamental indicator of human existence, <laughs> per definition, you know, when we are alive and we are longer alive, maybe that's what matters. Now, you could also uh, classify human development according to this ind indicator. And you also see different periods, the first vaccine, anesthesia, sanitation, check that out. How much did sanitation uh, contribute to life expectancy? Wow, that was a big boost here just by just by learning how to wash our hands, you know, also in, in hospitals and in general, start washing our hands. That was and then penicillin, of course, and now tissue cultures and genetics. So you might as well classify it like that. There's a book, a very influential book that has recently been written by Pinker. It's called Enlightenment Now. And he has a bunch of really fascinating graphs that show how humankind actually evolved and became better over the last few hundred years. And you can take any of these indicators. So what I'm trying to say here is uh, this economic theory and these classifications of periods of different long waves have to be taken with a grain of salt. At the end, that's just how some historians made this. And you know, several disciplines look at it this way. Historians actually started that with the Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, the idea that we classify a stage of human development according to the dominating technology. And we've done it in industrial revolutions. We continue to do that. But what I want to be very clear, that's not the only way you can look at that. So it's been a useful way. And somebody who is interested in technology as me, it has become very useful to look at the world like that. But Maybe you can come up with a new classification yourself with what matters to you as human progress, but very likely as well, you will find this dynamic, which is inherently in all kinds of evolution, this dynamic of creative destruction. Evolution itself is a brutal process where things have to die and new things get born and which leads then to these waves. So with this caveat being said, what can we then classify as these great surges, as these long waves? Does anything just go like, okay, I said now the steam engine or penicillin. Well, okay, these were big ones. So what is necessary? What are the technological requirements to trigger such a big surge? Carlotta Paris came up with four characteristics, and we will talk more about Professor Paris today. And what she says is that such a quantum jump can be seen as a technological revolution if it fulfills the following conditions. So these are four conditions. Number one, whatever it is that moves us along in our evolution, it has to be available in an unlimited supply, unlimited for all practical purposes. That means you, we will need to be able to create much of it. So for example, enriched uranium has been an important technology, but enriched uranium is not there is an unlimited supply. Silicon, on the other hand, yeah, that worked, or water, or steam, or electricity. Yes, they have been available not at an unlimited supply, I mean, also the amount of electricity is limited, but for all practical purposes, there can be a lot of it, much different than a rich uranium or, or, or rocket fuel, which is much, much more difficult to produce in that sense. Which leads to the second part of it, often that is also linked to clearly perceived low and descending relative costs. So if I have something that I can make relatively cheaper, it's because often because there's also an unlimited supply. So the unlimited supply can be because there's just not enough rich uranium or gold in the world, as contrast to silicon and steam, there's a lot of, but then also it can, it needs to become cheaper, whatever we have. There can be something that we have a lot of, but it doesn't become cheaper. So this then is usually pushed by a prolonged period of continuous technological innovation. Think about Moore's law, for example. So Moore's law made computation cheaper because we found a trick and we milked this cow for many decades. We just packed more transistors on the microchip and more transistors on the microchip and the cost of computation plummeted. It needs to be a general purpose technology. And that's a technical term, GPT. It's not a generative pre-trade transformer like 
chat GPT, these modern AI language models. GPT actually, that has actually been coined before, general purpose technology. And a general purpose technology means that you can use it for many different purposes. Electricity, you can use for many different purposes. Communication, you can use for many different purposes. Now, when we flew to the moon, it was a big event and um, you know, my grandparents were there glued to the TVs watching it, but did it really change the life of my grandmother? Not really, not like, not directly. It was cool, but you know, even now, decades later, you know, only the super rich fly into space. So it's not a general purpose technology that has clearly low and descending costs and uh, it's not available for an unlimited supply. So, you know, space traveling would not fit the characteristics of being a technology and especially not a general purpose technology that can be applied to many different purposes. And last but not least, then it often naturally, there's almost a conclusion, it transforms society. So it reduces the cost of capital, labor and products and changes them qualitatively. So there is the, it increases productivity. The input output ratio is changing. So before I put this into society and get that out and now with this new technology, the way that we transform things qualitatively also changes. We reorganize society. So these are the four characteristics. Unlimited supply, we need a lot of it. It needs to become cheaper. We need to be using it for many different things and it qualitatively changes the way society functions, the way society works. And this current paradigm fits all these four characteristics, the technology that we have, what I just call digital technology to make it short, which is information, communication, and knowledge technology. And it has been given many names. It's, first, it's been called the post-industrial society, because you know we went out of these industrial ages and we didn't really know like what's, what's going on, but we knew well, something new is emerging. So Bell, in a very influential, very pioneering book, called it the post-industrial society, very humble as well. Then we call it the fifth contrative, the information society, the digital age, the network society, the age of information communication technology. And we could just call it the digital age because the digital, I like to use it because it joins the information data and communication aspect with the knowledge and algorithm aspect. Both of them happen on the digital at the end. Both of them are information processes. So they happen on the digital paradigm. So that's for lack of a better word, I call it digital technology. And digital technology fits these four characteristics and hence is considered to be the driver of this current paradigm of social evolution.